and this button. Now, hopefully you are all okay. Yes? All good? You all well? Healthy? Happy? Quiet? Yes? Okay. All right. All right. Now, what we're going to do today, we've got a few things to do. We're going to be continuing on in our investigating about the market model. Now, uh, for those of you, yes, we're doing this all distance learning, and there's obviously going to be some potential issues technology-wise on your end or even on my end. That's okay. Please don't panic about those. Um, I'm actually recording the lesson, so we're going to be able to post those as well so we can review them later, uh, should you wish to. Now, yes, it is a bit unfortunate because with, because of the distance learning, we are pushing your pathway exam into the future. I, I don't know what happens if we're not back at school next week. I, I assume that we will be. We hope that you will be. If, if not, I don't know if that means that it then gets pushed even further ahead. I don't know. Um, or whether it then becomes that you do it as a distance uh, you know, through the computer exam. Uh, any of those sorts of uh, outcomes are possible. But we do need to continue on with the course because otherwise we might get a bit behind, all right, if we just don't, all right? So this time period now, I'm going to be hopefully making up for the time that you would lose when the pathway exam actually happens, yeah? So that, that's kind of how we're, we're working it now. Right now, in the classroom, I've posted a few things. One of the things that I have posted is your Nearpod uh, code. So what we're going to do is we're going to jump into Nearpod like this. Let me try. And we haven't all arrived today, but we're getting there. So presenting the screen. And so you should have posted to the classroom uh, the code KPUMH. KPUMH. So if you want to jump into that particular code, that would be fantastic. And you'll end up somewhere here. We've got five of you in already, so that's fantastic. Um, but if we could get the rest of you to join. Now, as per normal, the code's always at this top left-hand side of the screen, so you will be able to join um, and jump back in if there are any sort of technological issues that occur. Computers crashing, running out of batteries, etc. I don't know what lessons you've been having already this week, and Hopefully they've all gone okay, um, but yeah, we, we'll, we'll just do, we're not going to do, we're going to do like a, a slightly condensed version of a normal lesson, because otherwise it's going to be too overwhelming, right, to try and jam everything in. Uh, the distance learners will find that probably quite amusing, because they've been doing this distance thing for quite some time, all right, and trying to keep up with it all. But again, because it's all distance, the, one of the key things is, is that you'll need to make sure you're communicating, you'll need to make sure that you're asking questions, you're emailing your teachers, you're doing all of those sorts of things, and if there are problems, just let us know, okay? All right, so I've got 13 of you in at the moment. That's not quite everybody, but that will be a start. Here we go, 14. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we're gonna press on, and if you are able to, please join, all right? Now, we're going to move through this uh, to get to where we were, okay? So where we last discussed this, we were talking about different types of markets, what a market is, the difference between a product market and a factor market. So what is a market, different types of markets, product markets, factor markets, service markets, the government inside a market. We talked about all of those. We talked about, obviously, goods and services, factor markets and product markets. And then we all introduced the idea of competitive markets as well. And we had terminology that we use about market structures and market power. So we talked about the idea of perfect competition and the idea of monopolies. So there are, are two extremes. So we've got markets, market structures, market power. We've got monopolies, perfectly competitive firms, competitive markets, factor markets, product markets. There's quite a lot of terminology that we've thus far covered. So what I'm going to do, I'm actually going to do the stop sharing button now, and then I'm going to come back to you all. Hello. There I am. All right. Um, now, what we're going to do now, all right, I'm going to give you about a minute, maybe a little bit more, 
And what I'd like you to do, and this is always a bit tricky because there's a number of you, um, is what I'd like you to do is to talk, or you can use the chat functions as well, um, and I'd like you to review amongst yourselves, talk what the terminologies are that we've thus far covered in market. So what, what is a factor market? What is a product market? What is a market? What does it mean again? Uh, what is a competitive market? What does the word perfect competition mean? What does the word monopoly mean? So you don't have to do all of that all yourself. Okay, so you can pick one. I'm going to define this term. I'm going to define that term. So what I'm going to do so I'm not distracting you, I'm going to take my microphone off and then I'm going to allow you all to either talk and or chat and define reviewing by definition those key market terms that we've thus far discussed. Ready, set, go. Hey guys, um, I can start with the definition of market, I guess. So it's a group coming together, like of consumers and producers, for instance, and which meet and come to an agreement when purchasing or selling goods and services, and there will be an exchange of goods. Um, a market has to be legal, and it has to be a free market. Well, we make the assumption there's a little government involvement. So yeah. Um, I can go next. A monopoly is a market structure characterized by a single seller selling a unique product in the market. Yeah, that's a monopoly. Okay, I guess I'll go. Then um, a product market is for goods and services, whereas a factor market is for the factors of production. Um, I'll probably go in next, and I'll talk about the relationship between price and quantity demanded. So if there's a reduce in price, the quantity demanded will increase, and if there's an increase in price, the quantity demanded will decrease. So there's like opposite direction, so it's like inverse relationship. That's it. I guess I can go next, and a perfect competition is a competition. It's where there are markets with like similar products, and maybe similar prices, that's why they have a competition and they compete and they have a perfect competition. Oh uh, yeah, I'll, I'll go next. Um, yeah, so demand is the willingness and ability of an individual to purchase a product. Um, ability refers to, so the ability refers to the income of an individual and if you have if you have the income but do not want to purchase that the uh, purchase the item, then that's not effective demand, basically. Well, that was good. Excellent. Fantastic, team. You're rock stars. You really are. Well done. Now I'm going to hit the present now button and we're going to continue on and see where we can go. Uh, it is really good for you to do lots of review of the key terminology. You've obviously got your glossaries, etc. cetera, um, but keeping that going and also testing each other, checking that everybody else, you know, is able to understand the terms as well because you're all in it together. Okay. All right, now if we move on, perfect competition, imperfect competition, what is a monopoly, what is a connection, demand, we learned about, we did demand schedules, demand curves, we did a law of demand. We haven't yet. Haven't yet? Today, let's look at the law of demand. Now, let's go back one. There, that's, this is where we saw the demand schedule mapped out, right? All of the individual quantities demanded, all drawn in as a one curve, right? Now, in order for this to be an actual working relationship, then one of the things that we can do is this. We can have a law of demand. All right, and what we're doing there is we are saying that when the price increases, 
the quantity demanded will decrease holding all other factors constant so the idea of ceteris paribus which we've used we've discussed before right it's that scientific principle or terminology that we're going to use to ring fence or protect this relationship so the relationship between price and quantity so what we're going to assume is that nothing will change so therefore every time the price of a good rises or in this case decreases if the decrease in the price of the good then the quantity demanded rises and we say that it's going to happen that way all the time so therefore according to the science of economics this is what happens every time we perform an experiment with demand so therefore it becomes a law all right so that's a good terminology to learn then -da, fill in the blanks there you go Mr. David? Yeah? So it becomes a law because it always happens? Yeah, it's, it's that idea where we repeatedly test this particular hypothesis, this particular relationship, mm -hmm. and we say that because it happens this way all the time, therefore it is a law. Oh, yeah. right? Thank you. Kind of like the gravity idea, or that it's not a law. All right? Other physical science sort of laws that you might have, uh, so thermodynamics, for example, they are laws. Um, we say that with testing, we're able to prove this particular relationship. As long as we're able to hold everything else external that might possibly interfere, if we are able to keep all of those things out of this particular relationship, then in theory, this relationship should hold. That when price increases, quantity demanded will decrease. And vice versa, when price decreases quantity demanded should increase so that then gives us that picture of that demand curve that's downward sloping like a slide in the playground you get to whoosh, down the slide okay and it's the only way we know that it's downward sloping is because of the law of demand thank you all right Okay, um, right, so what we would have gained is answers that look somewhat like this. The law of demand says that as the price of a good or a service increases, the quantity demanded decreases, holding all other things constant, ceteris paribus, and vice versa. What does vice versa mean again? If you switch it, it's still the same. Yeah, so you're going to switch it around the other way. So then... It still holds as a law, if the price of a good or service decreases, then the quantity demanded should increase. All right. So it will still hold the other way around. Good. Very good. Very good. So there it is there, the law of demand. And our friend Alfred Marshall, who was one of the originators of the maths behind the demand curve. All right. So as we say here for the curve, what are we talking about with regards to the slope? The demand curve is downward sloping because it's an inverse relationship. So therefore, it is downward sloping. If you've got price on the vertical axis and quantity demanded on the horizontal axis, then the curve is going to be downward sloping. Uh, Alfred Marshall came up with these two ideas. They're called the income and substitution effects, and they help explain why this occurs. So now we know that it occurs. Price rises, quantity demand decreases. Price decreases, quantity demand it increases. But why? So it's partly to do with the idea of utility, because that's inside the curve. But there are other things that are inside the curve, too. And this is a bit more about the behavior, and so behavioral economics, 
of the consumers. So here we, we look at it, we say, the price of a good decreases, the quantity demand it increases. You, the consumer, feel you have more income because the price has decreased. You don't have more income, but your buying power, your perception of your income has actually increased. So therefore, you are now more able to buy and you're potentially more willing to buy because it looks to you like you have more income. So that's known as an income effect. Then we can talk about what's called a substitution effect. Again, good old Marshall came up with these ideas. And that is that you're going to try to, uh, basically everyone likes a bargain. So it's again, it's the psychology of a consumer. Everyone wants a bargain. So in this particular case, if the price of a good decreases, then you're gonna see that that has decreased and say to yourself, yeah, wow, I'm gonna save money by buying that particular product or more of that product. So you are gonna always substitute towards a cheaper product, right? So if the price is decreasing, quantity demanded increases because you see that as being a better deal for you and so there will be more quantities that you are going to consume of it. And it has, yes, you're gonna then make that connection obviously with your utility as well. All right, so that's the income and substitution effects. Now there is here a Neopod, and this one might be a bit more tricky for you to do, but have a go, see how you get on. A um, fill in the blanks, see how you get on. This one's a bit more difficult. Good. Well done. We, um, one of the things that you might be interested in, um, those of you who are thinking CAS related things, uh, and I'm not sure how this will work, to be perfectly honest now, it was going to work beautifully before, but it may not work that way now. Um, is that we are looking at having a, a student um, conference, but it might end up being virtual now, uh, about leadership. And my original plan was that the, I would invite year 12s, sort of, you know, cash-wise, um, to help organize and run it. Um, and then the other students who would come in for that particular conference um, they would then participate in the activities, etc. So all the activities and everything's actually all mapped out. It's just having learners who could come in like yourselves and actually help organize it. That was the original idea. Um, obviously, we're now looking into the future and thinking, eh, not entirely sure that we're going to be able to do what we were originally planning. And we were planning this last year, so before all of this sort of happened. So <clears throat> we're now looking at this particular conference being more workshop based so instead of it being over three days that it was planned for originally it potentially will be just one day um, but it would be a full day workshop about leadership and leadership skills particularly in the sort of the common you know common uh, modern era I should say and th these are you, you remember that I did a leadership workshop with you all at the start of your year 12 and it's similar to that but with activities that uh, originally was planned to get you up and doing leadership based things uh, and then I would have the year 12s doing it and as part of them doing it it was also them showing leadership that was kind of the idea behind that uh, but 
now we're looking at doing one day and we're looking at, at it being potentially completely virtual in order to make sure that we've then got other learners involved uh, from around the world because it's a it's a, a global well not a global sort of it's a southeast asian conference uh, workshop that you would be helping to run so how that sort of works going forward we're still debating mr vincent and i need to sit down well, i say sit down virtually meet um to have a wee discussion about how we might end up doing it and yeah i, I will need to then put together a virtual package instead of the, the actual physical package that it was originally going to be but that that's not a big issue necessarily because i've actually got all of that i just need to frame it the right way um and yeah how then i would get year 12 cas based learners involved if it's all virtual well that's another another thing i can do uh, and i can do it and i kind of mapped out in my head how to do that um, but again i'm just i'm just putting this out there because this is currently being planned so if there are those amongst you who are thinking cas wise nah, don't know what about this what about that um Eventually, once Mr. Vincent and I have, have virtually met, I think we're meeting this week, and once I get confirmation from the school and from the, the, the international body, it's uh, Fabicia, if you know Fabicia, yeah, um, they're the ones who are hosting this, so to speak. Um, so, yeah, so once that gets sorted, then I will be advertising um, to Year 12s in particular who might actually wish to do some CAS-related things. Uh, with regards to this and if that works then brilliant excellent fantastic but i'm just letting you know that that's something that's in the pipeline currently being uh, discussed and yay you're all sounding really enthusiastic about it Woohoo! yes yay mr david yes i'm very keen to be involved nothing no all right okay all right now as we move on through Here's the weird thing about economics, and this is one of those things where, yeah, we've talked a bit about this, I think, before, um, where we've created a law, but uh, it doesn't necessarily always work. So, you know, uh, maybe not. Now, some of you will actually know the particular gentleman who appears in the photo there. Does anybody recognize him? No. No? All right, well, his name is Thorstein Veblen. All right, amazing name, Thorstein, one of the better names in all of economics, other than people like Vilfredo Pareto, um, who we will discuss again a little bit later. Um, yes, so Thorstein Veblen, amazing name, and he, there's a whole theory that he created uh, that's been named after him. And so what we found was we'd created this law of demand. This is what has to happen, blah, 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 right? And then we said, well, hold on, because what about this situation? Maybe the law of demand doesn't work in this particular situation. What about that situation? Maybe the law of demand doesn't work. In, and we ended up counting up, a, <laughs> believe it or not, a whole lot of times and places and situations where the law of demand actually doesn't work. Or at least it doesn't work the way we think it works. That's probably more the case. That the law of demand will work under this set of circumstances, but not under these other ones. And it's these that we call exceptions, or exemptions in the case of this particular table, exceptions to the law of demand. There are certain circumstances where the law of demand, well, it fails, to be perfectly honest. <clears throat> and Thorstein Veblen came up with a lot of this as a... Um, academic work and one of the first ones that got named specifically after him is something called veblen goods all right so those of you who have gone shopping right you are probably quite familiar with veblen goods and you just didn't know that that's what they were called all right anybody ever seen a product um and thought why on earth did somebody buy that why why are there luxury branded products why do we have products that are like made of solid gold or gold leaf you know you've, there's cars in the middle east that are completely gold plated there are cell phones that are gold plated. why do we have these types of goods 
why is it that some people are prepared to pay thousands and thousands of dollars for the new iPhone 12 when they could probably buy, I don't know, some Huawei, 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 Huawei brand that's a whole lot cheaper? What is it about those particular products? And Thorstein Veblen had an idea. Now, when I went to university, we, we had a word that we would use for uh, Veblen goods, and it's a word that I, I thought was fairly universal, but when I've started teaching, I've, I've understood that maybe not everybody understands this particular word, and the word is snob value or snob. Does anybody know what a snob is? If, I, if somebody refers to you, hopefully they don't, as a snob, what are they saying about you? You're like pretentious, high-nosed. Well done. Yes, absolutely. So when I was young, which was an increasingly long time ago, one of the friends that we worked with, he would refuse to go into certain shops. No, 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 I, I, I don't you know, go into those sorts of shops, no. Um, and that would be because he would see those shops as being beneath him. Uh, and and you can you know you can kind of understand that I, I don't know if you've if you know of in New Zealand we have dollar shops so one dollar shop and two dollar shop where everything in the shop is a dollar or two dollars do you have those sorts of things in in, in Malaysia I don't know, you know we don't I'm, have them here but them? they're like a big thing everywhere else so oh, okay. <laughs> all, right? yeah. Um, you might find uh, maybe the market stalls, you know, the sort of like down in Chinatown um, sort of idea where the products, you know that they're going to be cheap, yeah, and you know that there's, you know, not everybody is going to buy them. There are going to be some people who, no, 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 I don't want to buy that. It's too cheap, yeah. Um, one of the expressions that we taught our son quite early on was the phrase cheap and nasty because he was looking at some toys, particularly when we were in China, that were copycat toys, um, and they were dreadful. And we said, no, we don't want to buy that for you because it's cheap and nasty. So every now and then he'll look at one of the copycat toys, because you can still buy some of them around and about the place here, um, and say, no, that's cheap and nasty, I don't want that. So the idea of a Veblen good is a luxury branded good, where people are going to buy that particular good, sometimes just because of its name. All right. So even though the price of that good might actually increase, people are going to buy this particular good specifically because of the price. Yeah. Does that make sense? Sir, is it like people would buy it regardless of the price because they want to flex? So they're like, oh, there you go. There's a word that I'm, I'm not 100% familiar with. Uh, flex. Um, I'm going to say yes. Okay. Because I think you're meaning the same thing I am with regards to snob value. It's like flex is kind of like show off and like. Show off. There you go. Yeah. Show off. Yes, absolutely. So if you want to walk around with the latest gear, clothing or otherwise, and show to people, hey, I've got so much money, look at me, I'm yeah, that's a Veblen effect. You're buying it because of that sort of snob value, right? Um, the idea that people will and producers will deliberately charge a higher price because people will then assume it's a quality product. Yeah? The next one that's an exception to the law of demand kind of works in the opposite direction, and they're called Giffen goods. Now, Giffen goods are a particular type of good, and we're going to come across them again a little bit later on, but this is just to sort of set the stage. Um, a Giffen good is, is a what's called an inferior good. Um, so what do you think an inferior good might be like? What, how would you explain a good that might be you might consider to be inferior? Probably like you said, fake toys, stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. That would be a good one. Now, if you could then imagine it being all the way at the bottom of that scale. So not only is it inferior, it is very inferior. It is like the most inferior of the inferior goods. All right. It is extremely inferior. Why on earth would somebody buy that particular good? 
Well, what Thorstein Veblen and others have, have suggested is that there are some goods that are so bad that they're ridiculously cheap. So it might be that they're the only thing this particular person can actually afford, so they're going to buy them. Regardless of the price, regardless of their income, they have to buy this because they can't afford anything else. Um, and so a classic example of this is, uh, well, it's, I say it's a classic example, it tends to get disputed, this particular example, depending on which academic circle you move in, or whether you move in circles at all. I mean, it's probably better to walk in a straight line, but in any case, um, is, is the Irish potato famine. Now, if, if there are any history students in the room, are there any? No? Are you aware that there's a subject called history? No, doesn't happen. Okay. Um, you might have learnt about the Irish potato famine because a whole lot of people died and it's actually proved to be quite uh, instrumental in changing the fabric of the world because what happened was the, uh, in Ireland, this is going back a long, long way, right? In Ireland, uh, there was uh, the staple food, the food that everybody ate was potatoes. It's, it's a bit of a stereotype in Ireland for the Irish people to eat potatoes. Potatoes, potatoes, right? Um, and what ended up happening was some of the potatoes got, they became rotten. There was like a, um, a bacterial kind of infection in the potatoes. They all went rotten, right? They had a whole harvest of these potatoes that all went bad. Okay? But the problem was, is that that's all they could afford. So despite the fact that this particular good, right, was actually not a, a, a really an acceptable product, right, because it was rotten. It was basically rotten potatoes. The people whose livelihoods depended on the sale of potatoes couldn't then afford to buy anything other than potatoes, and the only potatoes they could afford to buy was the rotten potatoes. So that's what they did. They bought the rotten potatoes, and a whole lot of people in Ireland at the time got really quite unwell, and a number of people died. And it was so bad, there was starvation, there was all this sort of thing happening, that a whole lot of people in Ireland said, right, that's it, we're leaving. And they actually left. They migrated out of Ireland and went all around the world. And so when you read about the Irish migration around the world, this is one of the biggest times when that happened. And some really significant, amazing families have actually come out of the, um, basically the Irish potato famine. So if you're looking now at a country that you might have heard of called, I don't know, the United States of America, a whole lot of Irish people fled to America as a result of the Irish potato famine. And one family you might have heard of is currently running for the presidency of the United States, and that is Joe Biden. His family, if you go back, you know, a few generations, right, quite a few generations, actually migrated to the United States as Irish people from Ireland on the basis of the Irish potato famine. So the Irish potato famine in a roundabout sort of way could be you know, <laughs> having an influence over the U.S. presidential election. And that was something that happened all the way back in uh, about the uh, 15, 1600s, somewhere around there. So a long time ago, this is what happens. Yeah. So it's considered an exception to the law of demand because even though the food was essentially the most inferior product that you could possibly imagine, it was still being consumed. All right, so therefore, that shouldn't happen according to the law of demand. Uh, there's a more modern example, if, if the 15, 1600s aren't modern enough for you, there is a more modern example, and that is the country called Venezuela. If you're familiar with the country of Venezuela and, and South America, um, you might be aware that they had an economic collapse the other year. They had hyperinflation, they had an economic collapse, their entire economy is in absolute ruins. It still is. Right? It's, it's not really picked up much since then. But one of the problems that they found was that they ended up not having food for people to eat. And they ended up not being able to afford the food that they could eat. So what was left? Well, rotten meat in this particular case. So in Venezuela, they had entire markets that were selling rotten meat. And they had a whole lot of people who that's all they could afford. And sometimes they couldn't even afford that. So that's what they were buying, was rotten meat.
and eating that because it was the staple food, the food that if they didn't eat it, they would die. All right, so that is a, perhaps a more modern example of a gift and good. It's the rotten meat in Venezuela, maybe. Although, as I said, a number of academic economists actually now are actually debating this particular theory as well as to whether the gift and goods actually even exist at all. All right. Well, yeah. Sure. yeah. Um, so basically, a given good is like, even though it's like an, in, in, even though a good is inferior, the the, qu the quantity demanded still increases until the point of, like, a budget constraint because they yes. have to like live off of it. Yes, that's right. Okay. So, I, 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 an inferior good should still behave in accordance with the law of demand. Right. right. But when it gets to the extreme end of that spectrum. So when you get to the very extremely inferior goods, the Giffen goods, this is what uh, Thorstein and others are uh, speculating about. Uh, when you get to that sort of end, then yeah, it doesn't then follow the law of demand. Okay. Yeah. And the next one uh, again is similar, but different, uh, same, same, but different. This one is about necessities, and you could make an argument about potatoes being necessities and all of those other sorts of things. But the modern example of, of necessities is things like uh, your insulin injections, right, for diabetics. So if, if um, you are in the unfortunate situation of needing those insulin injections, otherwise you die, right, then it doesn't matter what the price is, you're going to pay it. Right. And you might remember there was a case in America of a pharmaceutical company that was dramatically increasing the price of insulin. Uh, and there was a whole court cases and people getting arrested. And, and there's somebody, I think, in jail with regards to it um, because they were deliberately trying to exploit this particular idea. So even though the price was going up, the quantity demanded was actually increasing potentially or not decreasing because it was considered a necessity. Right. You can also make other um, connections with that. You could argue about things like uh, cigarettes. Uh, they tend to be, again, used in textbooks as examples of apparent necessities, where even if the price of them was to increase, say, for example, a government says, we're going to put a tax on cigarettes because we don't want people consuming them because they're considered a demerit good. You remember demerit goods? Um, but even though the tax is on them, people are still buying them. And people are still buying them because they're considered a necessity for the people who consume cigarettes because they're addicted to them. So that is considered then an exception again to the law of demand. The law of demand will work, but only under these set of circumstances. If we move down one again, we're going to see things like the future price expectations idea. And this is part of, again, behavioral economics. People will see a price change but because they're expecting the future price to be different, they won't behave in the way you'd expect based on the law of demand. All right. So that, again, kind of runs a bit counter to that particular law. And so therefore, Thorsten Beblin and others have suggested it's an exception. Uh, and then there's the next one, the bandwagon effect. Now, I can't. have I talked to you about the bandwagon effect before? I, I probably haven't. You have with um, nudge effects. Yeah, with the nudge effects. Ah, okay. So again, the, this is the same same idea um, where you're, the bandwagon effect is talking about people getting on the bandwagon, uh, people following the band, right, wherever it goes from village to village. And therefore, again, it doesn't matter what the price is, you are going to buy this particular product because everybody else is. Oh, I'm going to buy it too, because everybody else is buying it. Okay. The bandwagon effect. Uh, they probably should come up with a more modern way to explain that, other than bandwagon, because you, you really don't know what a bandwagon is. But still, they haven't yet. Uh, and again, the next one, situation of emergency or crisis. This is exactly where the world is at the moment, right? But also from an individual consumer point of view, this is you if, say, the washing machine breaks or the air conditioning breaks. Well, at that sort of point, it's not going to matter what the price is. You're going to buy it because you need it. It's, it's, it's an emergency. It's a crisis. You will pay for it. All right. um, or, you know, you, you have a, a car crash and you have to go to hospital 
well, look at the bill. Well, you have to pay for it because it's an emergency. You know, it's, it's that sort of a situation that we're talking about. Here. So even if the price was to rise, you'd still pay it because it's an emergency. Uh, ignorance, this is coming back again to behavioral economics because we're now talking about the lack of information. Uh, people, consumers using their cognitive biases, their heuristics, etc. They don't know everything. So therefore, even though the law of demand says this is how they should behave, they may actually not behave that way because they just simply don't know any better. All right. And that last one there, the change in preferences, tastes, fashions, well, when they change, again, it's not necessarily going to matter what the price is uh, of that particular good. Right. So everybody decides they don't like the good, they're not going to buy it. It doesn't matter that the price has fallen. Right. right. And if we move on from there, we can ask you to explain two exceptions of the law of demand. Have a go at this. Here we go. That's the right idea, Ariane. Work, no. Yeah, that's right.
So one of the issues, I guess, with the um, idea of imperfect information, and I will stop sharing now and jump back to see all. There you are. Um, is that we, we kind of have to, as, as you understand, use the, our heuristics um, in order to make our decisions. So at the moment, we are distance learning. The school has made a decision about an imperfect knowledge of the future, et cetera, with regards to your pathway exam. Um, we are anticipating, assuming the numbers improve, we are anticipating that your pathway exam will then be uh, the, you know, next week. All right. So not this week, but next week. Um, and we are anticipating that we will be back at school for that. Now, obviously, we're, we're going to be teaching you content this week. But at the same time, you will also, it will be advisable at the same time for you to keep ticking over your revision of the past material that's likely to then be in the pathway exam. So that's for all of your subjects. Okay? Um, and it's probably a good strategy for you to practice your writing. Um, I would say for my subject in particular, but maybe for the others as well, I don't know. Um, so that you are, you know, you don't have to do a lot, but just keeping ticking over, practicing writing under time conditions, time constraints, those sorts of ideas, yeah? So just keeping those skills um, there. Uh, you might have had a bit of a break over the summer, uh, over the summer, the half-term break um, as well. Right? And that's absolutely fine. Now, uh, anticipate, oh, thank you to those who have sent me questions as well, by the way, over the half-term. Um, I was able to help you, hopefully, with those. The... Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to actually stop the meet now um, so that you can have a bit of a brain break uh, because you've obviously got another lesson this afternoon um, and it's good for you to have regular brain breaks. Maybe get up, stretch your legs, go do something physical, uh, do some push-ups, I don't know, uh, run around the house, <laughs> scaring people, uh, whatever it is that you do uh, to give you to get the blood going through your brain again. Um, so do something along those sort of lines. And, and then you can obviously have some lunch and, and just have a bit of a rest uh, before your next lesson. Uh, what I'm wanting is we're obviously going to keep going with the market model. Okay, um, I'm not going to set you any big assessed work because I am planning on you doing your pathway exam. Okay, um, So therefore, there's not going to be any big extra questions that I'm going to be asking from you. I would like you to review the terms as we go through, just on a regular basis, just making sure you understand them. So for example, today, obviously you've got the law of demand, you've got the exceptions to the law of demand, and you've got the income and substitution effect, because all of those will play into the next steps that we're gonna be going to, and the next parts of this particular market model we're gonna be looking at. Uh, they also play into some of the theories that we've thus far already discussed. So, example, behavioral economics, we've mentioned a few times this morning, um, how behavioral economics is able to help you as a consumer and help us understand consumer and producer decisions and the government decisions, right? Uh, well, if you have a look at what we've discussed today about exceptions to the law of demand, right, we can see where the behavioral economics comes in. We can see that this will clash because of these particular exceptions, etc. right? So, if there are exceptions, then there's other behavioral phenomenon and on at work and not the actual theory that we assume. So all of it does actually connect. And obviously the history of economic thinking, uh, this is new thinking, well, new thinking, new-ish thinking that was added on to the economic thought of Marshall and Adam Smith, right? who came up with the market model in and of itself. And obviously Thorstein Veblen has come along and said, well, but what about this and what about that? So you can actually still relate this content of work with the content of work we've already covered. Okay. Now, so we're going to finish here. I'm going to stop the meet here, but please, if you have got questions, you feel free to email, um, and I will attempt to answer them through the email medium. Uh, otherwise, I will see you next tomorrow. I think I need to double check. Okay. Um, there you go. Um, is this presentation on the website because I can't find it? That's a good question. Um, probably. 
but it won't be on, it'll be in the market site, it won't be in your exam site. Yeah, I was just on the exam, uh, on the market site. I, didn't, I couldn't find it unless I'm like blind. Okay. All right. Um, that's all right. I, I, I will, I, if it's not there, I'll put it there. All right. Thank all right. you. No problem. Um, now, the other thing that is a, a headache um, more than in anything else for you is because we're also not at school um, and effectively nobody is at school, it also means that it is putting back the uploading of your um, digital textbook as well. Uh, because the resource woman isn't at school either. So it's going to then take until we're back at school in order for that to be even continued from where that left off. So, again, that's unfortunate, but, you know, we can we can deal with that. Um, but it won't be a problem, for obviously, for your pathway exam. You've got more than enough for that. Um, but as said, if you have questions, anything that you want answered, pathway exam related or otherwise, please do ask. And because we're doing this distance-wise, you can't just like roll into my classroom and ask. It's really important that you just do it when you think of it um, so that I can get you an answer back as quick as I can. Okay. Otherwise, have a fantastic day in whatever lesson it is that you are going to be taking next. Bye, sir. Thank you. Bye. Hey, Cornita, have a great day. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Mr. David. Bye. Thank, Thank you, Mr. David. Thank, Thank you, Mr. David. Bye. Bye. Um, Mr. David, I have some questions. Yeah. Uh, can you explain everything after Giffen Goods, the apparent necessities and everything below that again, please? Oh, yeah. Uh, yes. Um, talking about the idea of apparent necessity. So the word apparent means it's not necessarily guaranteed that it is a necessity, all right? Um, it could be a real necessity, something you have to have in order to live. And therefore, if it is a necessity, then it's not gonna matter what the price is, you will buy it, Because okay? if you don't get it, you'll die, yeah? If it's an apparent necessity, then it's a necessity, you view it as a necessity, but it may not be that if you don't have it, you'll die. So the example I gave was things like smoking. For people who are smokers, um, to them, having a cigarette is a necessity. Yeah? Or for me, Coca-Cola. Yeah? Something that you're addicted to. It's not really going to matter what the price is. You're going to buy it anyway. Does that make sense? So, but you can still live if you don't have it. If it's an apparent necessity, it's an right? apparent necessity, yes. But it's about the behavior with regards to your consumption decisions at that point. What about future price expectation? Yeah, that one's a little bit more complicated. Again, that's your, your it's the psychology of you as a consumer. So it's that behavioral economics again, uh, coming back to, to frighten us. Um, it's, it's the idea that you will think you're supposed to think about the future and what the future prices might be. So if, for example, you think that the future price is gonna be lower, even if the price now is, has reduced, you're still gonna wait because you think the price tomorrow will be lower. So there may be no change, no increase in your quantity that you consume. Or vice versa, you expect the price tomorrow to be higher than it is today, but the price today has risen. But you, instead of decreasing your quantity, you increase your quantity today because you're expecting tomorrow's price to be even higher. Does that sound okay? Yes. And then uh, the bandwagon effect? Yep. The bandwagon effect is about, it's, it's, it's like trends. It's... it's it, you are going to follow a group of people, right? So whatever decision they make, you are going to make that decision as well. You are jumping on the bandwagon, that's an expression, or you're following the bandwagon. Um, it, it's, it's become popular. It's become trendy. Uh, everybody's doing it. Uh, and when we say everybody, it might just be like the social media influencers. Uh, buy this product because I found it to be really good, yeah? Um, this video is sponsored by, yeah, um, they're influencing you 
to jump on the bandwagon. So it doesn't matter what the price is, the price might have gone up, but you're going to still buy it because your friends, your influence, the people who influence you have told you to buy it. And the situation of emergency or crisis? Yeah, that, that one should be a little bit more common sense to us because we, we kind of are living through it at the moment. Um, the idea is, is that when there is an emergency, right, when there's a crisis that occurs, whatever shape that is, um, the product that you need to help you resolve that situation, you're going to pay the price for it regardless of, of the price. Yeah? So your house is on fire, you're not going to negotiate over the price of a bucket of water. You're just going to pay whatever the guy wants for it. Yeah, so California with all the wildfires, etc., they're not sitting there with their calculators going, well, how much does it cost to put these wildfires out? They're just saying, we've got to put these wildfires out no matter what the cost. And, and uh, ignorance? Ignorance, again, is back to where we were talking about consumer behavior. It's, it's, it's the, similar to the idea of imperfect information. Uh, only in this context, it's the person themselves, the consumer themselves. They just don't know any better. So they're not sitting there doing the calculations about their levels of utility. They're not sitting there thinking about how this impacts on anything else. They're just sitting there thinking, uh, I want to buy it. The price has gone up. Uh, I want to buy it. Because they don't know. They're not, it's, it's not about rationality. It's just they don't, they're not uh, intellectually capable potentially of understanding um, that the price has risen. So therefore, it makes it less able. They're, they're going to buy it regardless. Yeah. And for the change in preference and taste? Yeah. Again, that's about trends. It's uh, about more consumable products, um, which you see happening all the time. Uh, and they, they it, it's, what is it, the expression, waxing and waning. They, they come and go. Yeah. So... All of a sudden, it will be very trendy. So in uh, what is it, the 1980s or 1990s, when you had the little electronic pets from Japan, uh, whatever they were called, um, and they were very trendy, and, and everybody had them. Or the other year, they had the fidget spinners. Again, very trendy. You had to go out and you had to buy them, and all the different kinds of them, and it, yeah. Uh, and then the trend has died away. It's it's just gone. Right? Is it a bit like the bandwagon effect? Yes, it is. Um, uh, very similar, but the bandwagon effect is more about the influence of the people in the band. Um, so, yeah, the influence of it as opposed to everybody just liking it. Does that make sense? Yes. So one is about somebody directly influencing you, and the other one is you have grown to like something, uh, which then changes over time. Does that sound okay? Yeah. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Have a great day. You too. Thank you. Bye.